Welcome to Rev Up Your Potential with Hilda Gann, the podcast where entrepreneurs, business leaders, and HR professionals share tips, strategies, and trends in their area of expertise. They also talk about their successes and struggles along their career and business journey. If you love to learn through storytelling and find people fascinating, join us. Welcome back to another episode. Today, my guest is Arlene Chan. She is an author and an award-winning Chinatown historian who brings the history, culture, and traditions of Chinese in Toronto and Canada to life through her speaking engagements, tours, books, and essays. Arlene is the president of the Jean Lum Foundation that awards high school students of Chinese heritage from across Canada. This Jean Lum Foundation Award is a recognition of her mother's legacy, and we'll be talking about Jean Lum throughout our conversation today as well. Arlene also serves as an advisor for the Museum of Toronto's Ontario Infrastructure Group and the Toronto Public Library's Canadian Chinese Archive. It's a delight to have you, Arlene. We are are bringing this episode live during Asian Heritage Month. And I've so long wanted to bring you on and talk about your work and bringing, bringing to our kind of awareness of the Chinese in Canada and the rich history we've had during that time. So welcome. Thank you. That's a um, very warm introduction. And I'm so um, delighted to be here today and talking with you. Good. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more in depth. I gave people a highlight and from the the intro, people realize that you are very knowledgeable and want to share your knowledge, expertise and passion about the Canadian Chinese history. Yes, I've, um, I'm a third generation Chinese Canadian. Um, and so I grew up in Chinatown in Toronto here, and even when, since I've been very young, when I was a teenager, I was always interested in learning more about the Chinese community in Toronto. And as much as my parents were very, very involved in the Chinese community here and, you know, ran a very successful Chinese restaurant in Chinatown, mm -hmm. I was very interested in, and I loved reading. And so I'd go to the library and look for books about Chinese people, about Chinese history, Canadian history, and there was so, so little there. So this was something that um, I carried through my high school years, through university years, and it was just whenever I read any little tidbit in the newspaper or magazine, I would cut it out and save it. And so this was something that was always in the back of my mind, this this curiosity and this interest to learn more about our history and and why we celebrated our festivals and why we ate certain foods and you know how long have we been here all these kinds of questions were in my head but I, I wasn't able to find the answers so this was something that really motivated me later on to to look more into this and and to do something about that and so this basically has turned into a, a career for you right well I'm a librarian by profession and I retired over 15 years ago and fortunately before I retired I mean so my my profession as a librarian just reinforced my love of reading my love of research being there to help people to find information um, so but before I retired I was very fortunate to start writing and getting published um, so it started off very in a very small way and very much by accident that I got into publishing my first book and um, so this was something that was a gift to me while I was working. And then when I retired, I was able to devote a lot more time to my writing and my and also doing a lot of presentations and started doing tours of Chinatown. So um, it really opened up doors for me. So I'm actually now kind of like a, everybody says, oh, Arlene, you're not retired. You've started another whole career. So it's true because it's uh, something that. I've always wanted to do since my high school years of looking into our history and learning and researching it and given being given this wonderful opportunity, like even speaking with you today to have this opportunity to share my story, to share the stories of the Chinese community here in Toronto and across Canada. So you're very modest when you say this was gifted to me of uh, this book. Tell me about 
this story behind the gift and the book that really opened a second act, a new chapter for you? Well, what happened was uh, my mother, Jean Lum, who um, at Back in the day, um, she passed away in 2002, but um, back in the day, so I'm talking about after World War II, going into the 70s and 80s, my mother was regarded as the unofficial mayor of Toronto's Chinatown and a spokesperson for the Chinese community. And this was really, um, she was the kind of person who was really breaking glass ceilings at the time, being a Chinese person, being a Chinese Canadian, and being a woman on, on top of all of that. For her to be um, given this position, which she earned, and she didn't go out to look for it. She just got it by her own reputation of speaking out um, for her concerns for the Chinese and how the Chinese community was being treated. And um, so what happened was um, my mother had been most carefully and diligently covered in the media through you know newspaper articles and magazine articles national film board made a documentary about her called quo vadis mrs lum in the 60s um but a publisher um wanted to have a children's book written about my mother because what i experienced growing up going to the library not finding any books about any chinese canadians or even chinese people in general um this publisher recognized that um, absence in our Canadian literature. So he had approached uh, someone to commission somebody to write a children's book about my mother's life. So things were not progressing as he had hoped. And so he talked to my mother. He said, Mrs. Lum, I know your daughter is a librarian. Do you think she might be interested in taking on this project? And my mother's immediate response was, oh, no, 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 Arlene, <laughs> she's working full time as a librarian, very busy. She's got two young children at home and her husband, as supportive as he is, he's in the food and hospitality industry. So he's not at home a lot to help out. So my mother, of course, told me that. And I said, wait a minute, this is like, this is a door opening. And I'd done some writing when I was in high school and in university, um, you know, literary writing. And But this, like, this whole idea of writing the story about my mother, I said, this is, this is something I can't say no to. So I said, why don't I talk to the publisher? Um, so I did. And I said, why don't I write one chapter of this book? which is, again, a children's book about my mother's life. And if you like it, then, you know, I'd like to take on this project. But if you don't think I've got it in me, I'll totally understand. And, you know, that's fine. So he read it and he liked it. And so that was <laughs> that was how I started writing. Uh, writing. So that was almost like it. it is a gift. And, um, you know, my mother had always told us about her stories and so now writing this book, I had to re ask her again and again. I had more questions to ask her. And so in the end, I um, published this book in 1997. It's called The Spirit of the Dragon, The Story of a Proud Chinese Canadian. And um, I really felt um, that it was such an important addition to the literature about the Chinese in Canada, because for my mother to be written about that and written for children, because as I mentioned earlier, a lot had been written about my mother for adults in terms of newspaper and magazine articles, but for children, because I think it's so important when you read something, you see somebody and you say, boy, I, I, would, I could be like her. She's Chinese Canadian. I'm Chinese Canadian. I'm a person of color to see, to see something when you go to the library, on the library shelves, is a story about this remarkable person. And I'm I'm not being boastful because my mother earned every part of all the recognition that she received and being the first Chinese Canadian woman to, to be inducted into the Order of Canada was just, a, again, one of the many recognitions that were given to her during her lifetime and even after her lifetime. So for me, it was a huge accomplishment that the Children's Book Canadian Book Centre recognized it as a, a book that deserved to be on a list because they really felt it was a very um, 
well-written book, which is, was great for me, and also something that was really filling in um, a gap that were, that was in our, our book collections here. So I'm, I'm very, very proud of that work. And then what happened was after I finished that book, um, was Umbrella Press, the publisher said, She's, he, she said, um, he said, Arlene, do you think you might be interested in doing a second book? <laughs> and this book would have been, it was, and so one thing led to another thing. So it's just been, um, I've, I've published now seven books and they've been with uh, several different publishers, but it was just like one project, writing project led to another writing project. So um, I've just, that's why I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm very blessed to have been given all these opportunities. And that very first one is the one that launched uh, yeah. my writing. Cause I would never have guessed that I would become a writer. Um, Cause I'd done short stories and poetry, but to actually be published and to have my books in the public libraries across Canada, it, that's huge for me. And so much realizing one of my dreams was to um, make the history of the Chinese in Canada, the history of so many outstanding Chinese Canadians who have made a difference in Canada being, I think, the greatest country in the world, um, being a little biased, having been born and raised in Toronto and lived here my whole life. But I just feel that the the, the voices, the stories of the um, so many different immigrant groups, so many different um, newcomers who have come here. Um, these stories need to be told just to remind us that what we have today in Canada did not happen overnight by accident, um, just by good luck. It was because of all the hard work of people like my mother and all the other newcomers who have come here. Because I always remind people that we are we are a land of immigrants and everybody here has come at one point or another in our history to join our Indigenous peoples who were here thousands of years before we started arriving here. And so these stories more than ever need to be told because um, even our history of our Chinese in Canada, when I go and do presentations, one of the most common uh, feedback that I get from audience members is, I never knew these stories before. And so this is something that I think is so important that our history was built on so many stories like this. Um, it's through, you know, all these it's stories. So many chapters. Oh, you know, so many different. The chapter begins with those that first yes. generation of people like your parents, like my parents, who came over in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah. And people don't realize the story. You know, people come later on, think it's their struggle is hard, but it wasn't like they were the first people to come and, and pave the way. And I want to spend a few minutes highlighting your mother's accomplishments because she, she is an amazing person. And I, I will share my anecdote, but I don't want to, I want to emphasize what an amazing woman your mother was. And, and I, and I'll share this one anecdote because we were talking about, um, when you were growing up voraciously looking in the library for things and you said, I was looking for a role model. You know, I didn't have a role model and there weren't many Asian role models. And then, then your mother gets off the phone one day or, and you, and she tells you, I have just been, you know, I've just received word. I'm going to get the order of Canada. Can you share the, the, that little vignette of, of her chapter of life announcing to your family this? Well, yeah, and I agree with you totally that here I am saying I was going to the library looking for, you know, books to read about people who could be my role model. And all this time, my mother is a role model, but she was my mother. So exactly. anyhow, and she, and she was doing all this community work. She was, you know, doing this and she was the chair of this and she was heading this uh, campaign. And then when she announced to us that, oh, I just, I'm, I've just received the order of Canada. And we said, oh, that's great, mom. So what's for dinner? You know, you know, it's just, we, it, yeah. it's just like, this is my mom and this is just something that happens and, you know, she deserves everything, but we really didn't give her that the credit that was due. We were just, um, I just, we were just kids and, you know, the whole yeah. world revolved around we us. And meanwhile, even we have this amazing role model at home right. that, we I mean, didn't, the, you know. what's the order of Canada? It could have been like take out <laughs> food or something, right? It was just a, 
Yeah, but I grew up knowing of your mom's accomplishments. So for and today there the there is a school, a public school named after your mom. So for a a, a woman, a Chinese woman way back in your we're talking 50s, 60s and 70s when she was building her the activities. She wasn't fishing for these accomplishments. These came by the way. And for her then to be recognized with the Order of Canada and to have a school that is there and for you to to have this Jean Lum Foundation award, which, which was 25 years ago this year or in 2022, that recognition ha- started. So tell us about a few of the highlights of her accomplishments. My mom was born in um, Nanaimo, British Columbia, and family of 12 children, which in those early years was very, very unusual because my grandfather came in 1899, and and he was one of the few men who a few years later, he was able to bring over his wife from China. And all the early Chinese who came to Canada up until the, the 60s were from the southern part of China, from the Guangdong province. And so um, my mother grew up with this loving family of 12 um, brothers and sisters all together. She uh, loved going to school. She loved education, but she had to quit school at age um, 12. And this would have been during the Depression era to help support the family. And, And when she was 16, she was required to move to Toronto again to find work to help support the family. And she took along an eight-year-old sister, and in my grandmother's words, one less mouth to feed. So here were these two young kids, two girls, 16 and eight years old, arrive in the city of Toronto. And uh, my my mother worked for her older sister who had a, a restaurant uh, in Ontario. But within a year or so, my mother decided to uh, go out on her own. She borrowed $200 and opened up a grocery store at Bathurst and St. Clair here in Toronto. And from there, she was so successful that she started bringing over her parents and her brothers and sisters who all moved from British Columbia. And at the time that they moved to Toronto, at that time, um, discrimination and prejudice against Chinese community was at, at its height. Because in British Columbia, there were over 100 anti-Chinese laws and policies in place. So it was um, very desirable for the Chinese who were living in British Columbia to move eastward um, to find a more welcoming place to settle and work. So my mother was able to bring over her family to come to Toronto. And um, eventually... um, with my, the arrival of my grandmother and my mother being about 18 or 19, she said, you know, Jean, it's time. I think it's time that you should be getting married. Um, you're that marriage age. And so my grandmother found a matchmaker and uh, matched up with my father, Doyle Lum, who had come from China in 1921. And he had paid the head tax to come into Canada because um, up until 1923, there was a head tax on any Chinese coming into Canada. Um, and that was again, and my dad got here just a couple years before the head tax era was over and the government introduced the exclusionary law in 1923 that said no more Chinese can come into Canada. So I'm grateful that my dad, well, he paid the $500 head tax, but at least he got in before the exclusion law came. And, to- and we're talking $500 in 1920 dollars, which yeah, were yeah. an unfathomable amount of money. Yeah. You could have bought two houses in Vancouver at Thank that time with five hundred. So it was a lot of money. Right. So um, what what happened was when my mother had arrived in Toronto, and even though she was matched with my father and got married, the ratio of men to women at that time was eighteen to one. There were very very few women in Toronto, and really right across Canada because of the head tax, and later on because yeah, of yeah. the Exclusion Act. And if I and can just. If I can yeah. just add an anecdote too, my my grandfather came around the turn of the century. I don't know the exact date, and he was fortunate enough and one of the very few, like your your mother's family, to have oh, oh, to bring his wife over. And I never realized growing up that all eight of the children were Canadian born. I just thought they were they had come over. Some of them were Canadian born, like my mom would have been because she was the youngest. 
but I never realized they were all born. And that, like your parent, like your mom's family, was an unusual, unusual thing. It was more like China, Chinese and Chinatowns were just full of bachelors, you know, That's right. because there were no, not enough women of, to, to have, um, to get matched up with. So yeah, go on. I just wanted to share that this was unusual, but it's also a story that I share similar to, yeah. to you and your so, family. I'm so glad that your, your family had this family lifestyle because you mentioned bachelors and, you yeah. know, the, when I mentioned in Toronto, the ratio is 18 to one is what the, what we call the bachelor society era. There are all these men who did not have wives and family because they were separated from them and their wives and family remained in China. And this really, when my mother arrived in Toronto, this really had an impact on her because here she was coming from a very large loving family. And again, unusual, like Hilda, your, your family, very unusual to have a lot of children. Um, so when she came to Toronto, so all these bachelor society men, you know, working these long hours in the laundries and restaurants and then having no family to go home to, to celebrate festivals and have dinner with. And that really, really um, was one of the guiding lights for her work in helping to change Canada's immigration laws when the Chinese exclusionary law was repealed in 1947 and fighting to have more changes to ease family reunification to allow these bachelor society men to start bringing over their families from China. And so um, this was the kind of thing that my mother kind of got very involved in community work. At first, she was, you know, the head of the Women's Association here. And then she got um, became part of the um, helping to change immigration laws, going to Ottawa with delegations to plead with the government. Please, we need more changes. You, Yes, you've repealed the exclusion law for the Chinese, but. Um, you can't bring over your parents unless they're a certain age. You can't bring over children unless they're a certain age. You can't bring them unless you're a Canadian citizen. Those kinds of barriers were really preventing family reunification. And then my mother, she also later um, headed up the Save Chinatown campaign because some of you may or may not know, but our first Chinatown, which was located around Elizabeth and Dundas Street, Two thirds of our original Chinatown was expropriated to build new city hall in the new public square, Nathan Phillips Square. And so when the city had plans to demolish the rest of what remained of our first Chinatown, uh, my mother headed up a Save Chinatown campaign. So these were the kinds of community um, initiatives that my mother was involved in. And this was not because she had any training or she had any schooling and how to be a leader. Um, this was all based on her own natural ability to take leadership, to take charge, and to, to be an inspiration for others to be part of whatever campaign she was involved with. And it was through uh, one of her mentors was Pauline McGibbon, who later became the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. And it was Pauline McGibbon who said to my mother, said, you know, Jean, you've been very, very involved in the Chinese community, but you should go outside the Chinese community. Because as much, and this is something that I always like to say, that as much as at, after Second World War, which was a turning point in our Chinese Canadian history, as much as all the discriminatory laws against Chinese were repealed, um, the hardest thing to change are people's perceptions and attitudes towards the Chinese community. And so one of the, the from the advice of Pauline McGibbon, it was go outside the Chinese community um, because you'll be a voice, you'll be speaking on behalf of the Chinese community. And that's when my mother started going to speaking to different groups, um, advocating. Um, so that was so, so important, a pivotal point, another pivotal point for the Chinese community to have a voice outside the Chinese community. So these are things that my mother was doing on her own. So she broke a lot of glass ceilings, becoming the first Chinese Canadian on the boards of Women's College Hospital, University Settlement House, and so on. And so by doing so, I think what she did was, um, and having the restaurant, I have to, I can't forget to mention my parents' restaurant, the Kuang Chao restaurant, which Hilda will love Repeat to the name of the store. restaurant in case <laughs> so people can hear it again. It was called the Kuang Chao Restaurant. It was on Elizabeth and Dundas Street. And, you know, after World War II, there were um, the whole, um, up until World War II, people who were not Chinese did not go to Chinatown. It was a place to avoid rather than anything else. 
But after World War II, um, several larger restaurants started opening up. And one of them was my parents' restaurant, the Kuang Chao restaurant. Other ones were Sai Wu restaurant, Lai Garden, Nanking restaurant. Yeah. And they were called by many as the big four. And it was because of these big four restaurants, my parents' restaurant, Kuang Chao restaurant included, um, these restaurants served food that was adapted for the Western palate. So this is when we started seeing the growing popularity of Chinese Canadian dishes like egg rolls and sweet and sour chicken balls and those kind of dishes that today people kind of look down on. But these and I mean, people still love eating that today. But in those early years, that was all you could get. And because of this Chinese Canadian food, Chinatown became a destination as a as opposed to a place to avoid. So it was a destination not only for Torontonians, for visitors, but politicians, media, and these are the, the politicians and journalists are who shapes and forms public opinion and shapes our laws and policies. So it was so important to have guests um, like these that were so influential and in helping to change people's attitudes. And even the fact that Chinatown became a destination um, as opposed to don't go to Chinatown. It's, you know, it's got crime. It's got, you know, the, all the negative things that were formerly associated with Chinatown. So um, my mother's work was, again, breaking down barriers. How do we bridge the Chinese community with the larger community? And so through her work, through the Chinese, uh, the Kuang Chao restaurant, through food, through her going and speaking to groups, through her becoming members of advisory boards um, and boards of governors. These were so uh, important. These were so, um, in those early years, revolutionary for especially a Chinese woman to be taking on a role like that. So I can't, I can go on and on. And I know I, know. I have to stop <laughs> at some point and take a breath because I'd love for Hilda to share the story of her memory of going to my parents' restaurant. Yeah. When, when you were talking earlier, um, I was hearing your mom and I'm getting choked up now because she was a special person. Okay. So get strong, Hilda. Um, I was a little seven and eight year old girl. And, and before that, going to Chinatown on the weekends and dim sum was, was offered at, at, at your parents' restaurant. And I think it was the best dim sum because I don't remember going to anyone else's restaurant for the dim sum. And I remember a seven or eight year old girl going there and, you know, you have to go to the bathroom or whatever. And she, your mom would be at the front. And so over time she would get to know me and she got to know all the customers. She's a very personable, personable person. And and I just remember her always having a, a tiny chat with me. And she would remember things that we talked about, like weeks later or whatever. And I remember thinking, wow, she speaks English. Because a lot of my, my, my aunts and uncles couldn't speak English well. Um, and my mother spoke English well. But some of them couldn't. So I was... I was admiring her because she had a good command of the English language, but she also had this warmth and caring. And I remember thinking, I want to grow up to be like Jean Lam. Uh, forget about all the fancy stuff we just talked about, because I, I was a seven or eight year old. I didn't know anything about that, but I knew how she made me feel. I knew how she made me feel important and she cared about me. And, and so fast forward. My husband and I started our own engineering company and we said, oh, wouldn't it be nice to create a company where people love what they did and love where they worked? And we became a best workplaces in Canada, top 10, twice. And my videographer said, Hilda, where does this best, like being nice company come from? And I said, well, my husband and I wanted to do that. And he says, no, 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 no. It has to come from somewhere, like before the two of you said you want to do that. And I thought. And it was your mother. You know, all of a sudden I saw her face. I saw Kwang Chow. I saw the little seven and eight year old girl. And I thought, it's Jean Lum. She made me feel important. She made me feel valued. And she made me feel equal. And I'm not even a paying customer. I'm not the, I'm not the one that's going to pay that bill. She doesn't owe me anything. 
And I remember saying, I want to grow up to be like her. And to this day, my sense of of caring about people, my my hospitality, my true enjoyment of people stems from your mother. And I remember when I shared that with you, and and I have a little book back there that I created a book. I'm I'm, I'm in a chapter book, and the chapter is called "Rev Up Your Leadership," because of the word "rev up" is what I created. And then I thought. In that chapter book, I'm going to talk about the story of how RevUp came to be. And RevUp talks about equality and, and, and potential as two of the words in RevUp. And that's what your mother did. She really knew how to make people feel special, to make them feel valued and equal. And so there is a section of that chapter that talks about your mom and how special she was. She was very, very special. And, you know, this was a very natural thing with her that she, well, she had this warmth. She had this magnetism about her that if she went into a room, people would just sort of gravitate towards her. And she had an uncanny memory for remembering names, remembering stories. Oh, so how is so-and-so and how is so-and-so doing now? So when people went into the restaurant or anybody that she met anywhere, She had this instant connection and she would look at you directly and she wouldn't be looking around and say, who else am I going to talk to next? It was like you had her 100% attention. And so she had this natural gift um, that she um, just people remembered her for that. And it was her her natural ability to connect so much with people. Um, And so when you told me that story, like I'm I'm. I'm ashamed to admit, but every day I'm learning new things about my mother. And, you know, my mother, as I mentioned earlier, she passed away in 2002. But I always wish that I could have asked her this, I could have asked her that. Or can you can you remind me about this story? Because as much as there is so much that I remember and there's so much that's been written about my mother, there's so many things I would love to have asked her in my my senior years. Um <laughs> And, and I think because when you're looking back, you can see things very, very differently from the time, that, you know, as opposed to moment by moment. So um, yeah. I can really I was really so touched when Hilda told me that story about when yeah. as a seven year old and talking to my mother and having my mother's attention like that was very, very touching. And when you reinforce the fact that this is her persona, you imagine how many lives she has touched just by sharing her attention, her warmth, you, you always, I felt so good. I can still see her smile. I can still feel that warmth uh, when I've seen her, even years later when I saw her at other functions and she still remembered my name, even though we were not like, we were not close in, in any way, but she was just an amazing lady. And I know we've spent a lot of time talking about her You mentioned that it was a gift to have this book. And I think that gift was also that you got to ask her a lot of questions earlier in life. And maybe not enough, uh, but hopefully those that that come back into your life or or you meet for the first time and share a story of your mother will give you just an even richer, richer flavor. So I know for you that 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 book was really an important thing. Can you, can we just talk, we've kind of highlighted a bit about the Canadian Chinese history. What are some of the things you also want to share and illuminate? Because there've been many, many chapters of the Chinese. They're the original group that came to from Southern China. And then there were other groups that came. So what do you want to share with us in the time that we have together? Well, if I had a few hours, I could tell you everything, <laughs> but I'm going to just cherry pick some of the milestones. Please do. And <laughs> so, I mean, the, the first major wave of Chinese came to Canada to build the western portion of the Canadian Pacific Railway. And that uh, required um, Chinese workers, and there were over 15,000 that came to Canada. Um, I mean, even um, before Canada, like Canada... It was British Columbia agreed to join Canada in 1871 with the promise that there would be this transcontinental railway. And so without the Chinese workers, we would, that would never have been uh, accomplished. So the first major wave came in 1880 to 85 for that construction. 
And when that project was finished, the government said, we don't want any more Chinese coming here. And that was when the government imposed the head tax. And so that head tax was in effect until 1923. And it did not do what the government had intended. And that was to discourage more Chinese from coming into Canada. Because you have to think of what the push factors were to get out of China in those early years. And um, especially in the south part of China, where the majority of the early immigrants came from, the province of Guangdong, which had a lot of natural disasters. There was only enough food to feed one third of the population poverty, high taxes, high crime. So um, coming, going overseas to find work uh, was a, a helped many, many Chinese, early Chinese families. So this Exclusion Act was enacted uh, 1923 um, because the government said this head tax is not working. It started at $100, um, then went to $500. It still didn't uh, deter the Chinese from coming in. So this exclusionary law was in place from 1923 until 1947. And so then um, with the repeal, it took another 20 years until 1967. And again, this was through the work of when I mentioned earlier about my mother going to Ottawa to plead for more changes to ease family reunification, um, that it it was not, not until 1967 when Canada revamped all the Canadian immigration laws And so the Chinese for the first time could apply to come to Canada on equal footing with people coming from other parts of the world. So that's when we started seeing a change in the type of Chinese immigrant coming into Canada. And they started coming in from Hong Kong. And at one point, the largest source of um, newcomers coming into Canada were coming from Hong Kong. And that was with the help of a business um, incentive that the government introduced so that anybody that had uh, money to invest in Canada uh, would be uh, would be easier to get into Canada. So we had a huge infusion of money coming in from Hong Kong, which really helped our ch- our second Chinatown at Spadine and Dundas. And really, we started seeing the growth of uh, Scarborough in the Agent Court area with the Chinese moving out there, and then Mark and, and Richmond Hill out in the um, GTA. And so then what we started seeing were immigrants coming from other parts, like when the war in Vietnam ended, there were Canada welcomed many refugees from Vietnam, and many of those were um, of Chinese or um, ethnicity coming from Vietnam. And that's why many of the businesses, um, restaurants in Chinatown, uh, many are Vietnamese because they were Vietnamese Chinese. And then we also had many coming in from Taiwan, And lastly is uh, China became the largest source of newcomers coming into Canada Mm -hmm. for um, until recently, they were the main source of immigrants coming into Canada. So what did this mean for the population here is that um, up until 1967, our community was very homogeneous because they spoke the same language, which was basically Cantonese and the village dialects of Cantonese. Um, They shared the same uh, foods like, like Cantonese food. Um, the same celebrations and festivals. And then after 1967, with people coming in from all around the world, um, we started seeing that the Chinese community became very, very diverse. Mm -hmm. So first the Cantonese language and the village dialects was replaced by Cantonese, which was the language that people spoke from Hong Kong. And then up until this latest census, which was uh, uh, 2021, Um, reported that now Mandarin has surpassed Cantonese as the most spoken language. And, you know, after English and French are two official languages, the Chinese language is the most spoken language in Canada. So it just (laughs) to indicate the number of Chinese that are now living in Canada. So there it's really our homogeneous Chinese community is now very, very diverse with diverse foods, um, languages, dialects, customs, traditions, and living not segregated in Chinatown up into World War II, but now living everywhere and in all walks of life because of the the repeal of the exclusionary laws. And I have to, and I've forgotten to mention that after World War II, the Chinese got the right to vote right across Canada. And that's why I never miss uh, any elections because it was not until recently that the Chinese got the right to vote. And without the right to vote, the Chinese before could not go into professions like medicine and and law, and they could not run for public office. So talk mm-hmm. about not having a voice. They were not allowed to run for public office. And so the way they got that was, at least I. this is my Vancouver part of my, my life 
knowledge, my my husband's uncle went to, and fought in the war. And yes. those men in Vancouver, and, and I don't know the rest of, of Canada, but those men who went said, we are going to war to fight for Canada, and we want the right to vote when we come home. Yes. It took them a yes. while. It took them a while. But my uncle's name is on the wall of the, the, the Sun Yat-sen garden, which identifies all of the Chinese Canadians who fought during the war. And it says they fought for the right to vote. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's touching it's, moments in our in our Chinese uh, Canadian history. For, for sure. sure. For, for sure. sure. I mean, it was hundreds of Chinese Canadians who served during World War II, and they were met with a lot of resistance, even from their own community, because, it, you know, many people said, why do you want to risk your life, fight for a country that does not, that treats you like a second class citizen? But that was the whole point, that these young men and women said, we want to serve, to, to uh, fight with Canada, with other fellow Canadians side by side to show our patriotism, to show our loyalty, yeah. to show that we deserve to be given the right to vote and to be treated on equal footing with other Canadians. So um, so one of the main reasons for the change in the repeal of all the, the laws was because of the contribution of the Chinese Canadians during World yeah. War II. Yeah. You are so knowledgeable. Are you so passionate? I know a lot of what you talk about. I just don't know the numbers and the years. And that's the historian person. And that's the speaker of, of all things that you're sharing with us today. And I think a lot of people who've come over in the seventies do not realize the richness of the history of those original Chinese that came from Southern China. And I really appreciate you kind of sharing those things with us and we spent a lot of time talking about Chinese we spent a lot of time talking about your mom and I just want to acknowledge you and your your impact in helping us understand our our the richness of our culture and so what would you say are some of the highlights of your your I guess it's the second act that, that that's the one that's really rewarding at this point in your life what are some of those highlights for you? I, I'm just thrilled to bits that I get invited, I mean, like I'm talking about, especially um, Asian Heritage Month. Yeah. I've been uh, requested to do so many presentations at schools for community groups, for historic societies, to talk about the history of the Chinese in Canada. And this would have been like really unheard of um, 20, 30 years ago. So I'm just so delighted to be able to share the stories. And so many people come up to me, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't know this story, or they want to share their stories about their immigrant stories with me as well. So mm -hmm. it brings out, it. it's letting, it's letting people um, not feel shy about talking about their family history, and talking about the important contribution of all these early Canadians, all these early immigrants who helped to change the way things were to make our Canadian life as good as it is today. And I'm, I'm also very, very proud that so many people come to me and say, I, I read your book. It's just like been a, I'd never was not able to read any of this before. And I came across your books. Um, and now there are so many, students who are studying Chinese Canadian history, something unheard of when I was in high school and university, but now there are Chinese Canadian studies and so many students um, that reach out to me because they want to, to interview me and write about me. So I'm just um, very, very proud that I've been given this, again, this chance to talk about our history, to let more people learn about it. And especially so many of the newcomers who have come from China, and from Hong Kong, they don't know this history. No, and they, they arrive don't. in Canada and say, what a great country. This is, you know, this is what a great place to live, not knowing that it wasn't always like this. And so that's why I, I, I always tell people, you can't take anything for granted. And, you know, in this day and age, there's so many um, anti-Asian incidents that have been uh, happening Which during the pandemic. Yeah. And even before that was during SARS. And th these are things that remind us that, you know, we have to keep pushing forward. It might be baby steps that we're making, uh, yeah. stepping forward, but yeah. we really cannot afford to start slipping back to the to the dark days of our, our Chinese Canadian history. And, you know, they were dark days, and yet our parents didn't talk about it. They kept their heads high, and they helped us settle and integrate 
into this great country because yes. they just didn't talk about it. So it's good for us to learn about it, to talk about it. I'm I'm a proud third generation myself. My my daughter, my daughter and sons are fourth generation, and on my husband's side, he also too has had three like my my kids are fourth generation Chinese Canadians on both sides so that is unusual I don't expect a for a fifth generation of <laughs> of Chinese Canadians from them it, because we are so multicultural now uh, but very proud of the history and my husband settled into Windsor and like you I like to learn I like to find out things I I remember picking up your book one of your books in the in the um, in the law blogs, <laughs> so I had to grab it and I had to read it. But I I found this library book in Windsor about the Chinese Canadian in Windsor, and I read this section and I said, "Ty, this is your grandfather. This is your grandfather." Because you could read it because his grandfather was he knew politicians like your mom. He was connected, so he knew. In fact, he was told by by. Paul, now his name escapes me, but he was told that the the law has been repealed. Go, go back and get your wife and go back and get, and he said, I was on the next plane to China to get my family back here. You know, so yeah. this is the power of, uh, go as your, as Pauline Gibbons said, go out there, go and, and it was Paul Martin, go out there and connect because this is how you make people see possibilities and make change happen and yes. have change happen so I, i'm wondering if we can talk you had a beautiful family growing up and and one of the difficult moments in your life was losing your older brother you mind sharing a little bit about that yes my my brother my eldest brother so in our family there were three boys and then three girls and i was the eldest uh, daughter so i was uh, child number four but my eldest brother Douglas he uh, was a high school student a history a history teacher at North Toronto Collegiate and later on Riverdale Collegiate and he at a very very young age um, died um, at age 38 and so this was devastating for my parents and also for the children like all my brothers and sisters and this was the first um, death in our immediate family and so we'd never had to deal with something so close before and my my brother had died of cancer and in those early years because this would have been in the late 70s and um, it, cancer was very different people didn't even say the word cancer they said the c word you know mm -hmm. he had you know had the c and um, there was no support at all at that time. So we were really, we were really floundering. Uh, we didn't get any um, help from the hospital. We even the way we learned the news, it was just like very. Uh, it was a whole different era compared to what you you get today. And so to see my parents so broken up like that, and for us to be losing our brother like that, this really had an impact on on all of us. That. You know, this whole, my whole, to this day, I say, you have to live every day to the fullest um, because life is full of surprises. You cannot take anything for granted because losing our brother like that, it was just such a shock. It was such um, news that was so unbearable in those early years, but it just sort of, for me, um, was a wake up call never to take your family for granted. Um, we really supported each other. Again, that support that you get from your family um, brought us together. And again, that I, you know, the, uh, my my motto is like seize the day. And I know it's, a, it's, a, it's an overused phrase, but that was something that don't take anything for granted because you just, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So live in the moment and really live life to your fullest. Um, don't don't delay and postpone and do things. Oh, I'll do it later on because you just don't know. So this was something that was such an awakening. It was a, a tragic thing in our family, but it was also awakening for me, like opened my eyes to see things that don't take things for granted because you just don't know. I remember uh, this year when your mother's uh, 25th anniversary of the, the Jean Lum Foundation recognition happened and I thought I have to get down there you know face mask for sure 
but I have to get down there. I have to celebrate and be part of the celebration of this amazing woman. And I got to see your whole family. Like I, I I've seen some of them over the the years i think i think teddy gave me a ride home one day at a party one night and be, being a young woman i'm kind of thinking okay is he going to take advantage of me and i'm ready to open the door and run out <laughs> if i had to but your family is a nice family right and i just remember at that 25th the sense of of love of your family the closeness of your of your siblings and then the closeness of the of the children uh, and spouses and what a just a warm loving s celebration of your mother's legacy of the bonding of you and your family and those that you are honoring those students who were being recognized for for their achievements so it was it was a a, a really rich experience for me to share you are an amazing person your mother was an amazing person and we haven't even talked about the 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 girls dance thing <laughs> that I wasn't involved in. Unfortunately, I wish I was because I would have loved to do a ribbon dance <laughs> with you guys, but um, your mother and you, your, there was a tour group, right? A dance tour group. And that helped the cultural aspect of dance, bring it into society. And I remember on labor day down at the CNE every year, there would be just every many ethnicities sharing their dances and and your dance troupe would be down there with the, with the rest of them that was just another but that's what my mother was doing was going outside the chinese community so first you know chinese food is chinese culture food is yes, one of the yes. you know but dance was something else so my mother established the chinese canadian um dancers of um of ontario and I'm I'm not I'm not sure how you escaped getting to be part of that group because my mother was ro roping in all the young girls and boys to be part of this dance group. Oh, but you know what happened? My father passed away when I was uh -oh. ten, and we didn't go down anymore. So, okay. if I had been, but I I I was doing Highland dancing. <laughs> <laughs> before my pa father passed, so I think that's how I got I I missed the boat. Okay. <laughs> But that was just another like dance, food, music. These are things that bring, you know, cultures together and help other people see those different cultures. Um, we could be talking all day and I, I do have gone over time. What, but I think what we're talking about is so important and rich in heritage. So I'm sure people haven't stopped listening. So, But I do want us to wrap up. And I wonder if you could just share what's happening next for you. Oh, so Asian Heritage Month, I've got so many bookings to do um, tours and to do speaking engagements, working with uh, different school boards who are working on exhibits. And we're all um, very, very aware of a huge event this year, which is going to be July 1st, 2023. So it's just a month or so away. And that will mark the 100th year since the introduction of the Chinese Immigration Act of 1923, more popularly known as the Chinese Exclusion Act. And so I think the important thing is not to celebrate um, the dark history, which is when that, that dark period happened for 24 years when Chinese were not allowed to come into Canada, but to celebrate how far the community has come from that time yeah. to the present day and how um, how much the Chinese community is now part of Canadian life, part, in, you know, welcomed and um, included in larger Canadian life. So that's what we're celebrating. Um, and there are many events happening all around the city and right across Canada, many um, national initiatives. And what's happening here in Toronto is July 1st, there is the, at the, um, the memorial to commemorate the Chinese railway workers, which is at the foot of the CN Tower, I think it's still called the CN Tower, um, Rogers Centre. Uh, there's going to be an event there. And at Fort York, there's going to be a whole day of events there um, in the different rooms at the Fort York. Um, there are going to be exhibits um, at the York District uh, Museum. So many, many events that are happening all across the, the GTA. So um, I'm helping and working with many groups and also doing many presentations and participating in many events. Well, thank you for um, 
sharing that with us because I didn't recognize the the significant significance of this year. So I'll be on the lookout for some of those, those events. Arlene, thank you. Thank you for sharing your wealth of knowledge in terms of the Chinese Canadian history here and, and for sharing your, your gift that started the gift that you were given that started helping us to understand where, as they say, where do you come from? <laughs> uh, and, and I, I love history. I love learning about history and I love learning about, you know, the, how we grew up and, and, and how we can help others understand where they move forward from the experiences that many of us had before us. So thank you again for joining me today. I thank you, Hilda. Thank you so much. And to my listeners uh, and, and viewers, Thank you for joining in this episode. I have been so looking forward to sharing Arlene and Jean Lum with you because they're both special and special to me. So thank you. If you like this, give it a thumbs up, subscribe because there's so many, many amazing people that I love to bring on and to share with you. So you learn from them and in turn, learn a little bit about yourself because something you're, you're doing may be saying, I'm just as good as that. I am good. I am remarkable. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to Rev Up Your Potential with Hilda Gann. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our podcast on YouTube and Spotify to stay up to date on our latest episodes. For HR tips, news, and strategies, or if you're interested in being a guest on our podcast, visit our website at peoplebrightconsulting.com.